Hey guys, this is a video for anyone attempting solo or solo flawless Ghosts of the Deep on a Titan during Season of the Deep. This Sunbreaker Titan build is likely the safest build to help you survive in the game right now, aside from maybe a hunter with Assassin's Cow. It relies heavily on the charged melee throwing hammer to grant cure and generate sunspots to apply restoration. Simply put, Bonk enemies with the hammer and you should have enough healing to survive whatever this dungeon throws at you. We use the Soul Invictus aspect to generate those sunspots and Roaring Flames to increase the damage of our solar abilities. We'll also use the Healing Grenade for desperate times when we need a quick heal and there are no sunspots around. My fragments of choice are Empyrean, Wonder, Solace and Torches. Ember of Wonder is probably not required as the heavy handed mod on our arms will be doing a similar job in generating orbs, but the passive plus 10 resilience will help reach the 100 resilience that I highly recommend you should be running. Mobility is the only other stat that may be useful as moving underwater is quicker with higher mobility. I had 50 mobility and didn't have any issues, so no need to go crazy, especially if you're sacrificing resilience. The only exotic armor piece you need to run for this dungeon is Syntheseps. For those new to the game, these grant increased melee and super damage when you're surrounded. Spoiler alert, you're very often surrounded in this dungeon. At the end, you'll notice my damage build uses Path of Burning Steps. However, this is not needed. Just stick to a 100 resilience Syntheseps build. Now, if you're like me and play using a controller, you want to go ahead and assign your melee button to charged melee and uncharged melee in the custom controls menu. This will let you throw your hammer at an enemy up close instead of defaulting to the uncharged lunge attack. Here's a short clip of me punching an enemy up close with default controls and then again after adjusting the charged melee button. Back to the dungeon. There are three main loadouts I used for this dungeon, with a fourth loadout that swaps my weapons for final boss damage phase. We'll get into that when the time comes. I'm also going to assume that you know the mechanics, so I won't go into detail how to do each encounter, only some tips which will hopefully make it easier. Let's start with the ritual side encounter and parts before each of the main bosses. A kinetic grenade launcher with disorientating grenades the Risk Runner Exotic SMG and a Solar Machine Gun are my top picks for this part. I used a Malicious Birthright and an Unwavering Duty, both with auto loading because I'm lazy, and both take a while to reload. If you have something similar like Ignition Code or Avalanche, these would work great too. Ideally, you want to save your Machine Gun Ammo for use on Soulfire Binder Wizards and the Ogre. However, on the second group of Wizards, where 4 or 5 come out together, I find it much more efficient to use your super to clear this wave. Start by using the grenade launcher to disorientate large groups and focus on the wizards, otherwise their black mist attack can get you into trouble. Try not to get hit by too many arc moths. Even with Risk Runner, these can do crazy damage, so just be wary and shoot them down if possible. I would say the moths are the most annoying part of the dungeon, especially in the final boss encounter. On the third wave of adds where the Lucent Hive appears, you can generally just kill it with one or two charged hammer throws. But if you want to play it really safe, just shoot it down at a distance with your heavy. On the way back to the ritual site, be sure to use your sparrow to get there quicker, and preferably melee an acolyte or knight to get your healing buff, then machine gun down the wizard.
By using your super on the second wave of ads, you should have it back for when you enter the Arcology and need to clear a group of enemies in Hello Fathom before heading further down. It's not vital, but it saves a few minutes if you can clear the hive here efficiently. The first two rooms with lots of enemies can be skipped pretty quickly using your hammer and disorientating grenades. I'll demonstrate here in the background. Just melee an acolyte or thrall and blind the other enemies while running through. Make sure to give the knight a bonk for good luck, but let him live so he can report back and make the upcoming hive fear you more. Skipping ahead to the wreckage, I found it easier to jump onto the door which you come out of and then go across. Don't forget your disorientating grenade launcher can close up the shrieker for a short period while you get into a better position or if you need a breather from the incoming fire. In the room with all the holes, go through the fourth hole on the top from the left. You'll end up on the bridge with only two jumps to the end. Well done, you've made it to Ekthar unscathed. Here's the new strat, bonk everything. We do change weapon loadout here to maximize damage and for a little help with some light bearer wizards. Don't forget there is a flag point behind the acolytes so go place a flag. The encounter only starts after attacking the acolytes. Here my weapons of choice are Riptide and Attractor Cannon. There are a lot of mechanics in this fight leading up to a damage phase but nothing your trusty hammer can't solve. The three knights and the ogre that comes out thinking he's top dog, two bonks later, all dead. For rune symbols, I recommend coming up with your own names for the symbols. You see an ice cream? Great, me too. A pizza slice? Sure, you do you. Be creative and it will make it a lot more fun. What do you mean this isn't a man with a triangle Wait up, we need to keep it PG for YouTube. Just keep saying the symbol names in your head over and over while you're underwater and you'll keep track. Try not to be greedy and go for two or more symbols between bubbles. As mentioned at the start of the video, having high mobility helps as you do move quicker underwater, but it's not worth sacrificing resilience for if it means you'll be less than 100 resilience. Here's a map of the underwater area made by a guardian called Priony. It is really helpful if you're unsure where all the symbols are. My big tip on this part, and this applies to any class, is always go down the same hole unless you're super confident with what way you're going to face when going down the other holes. I always stuck to this left hole and after some practice you will know where all these runes are without having to look at the map. I found the wizards were the hardest to track with the throwing hammer so this is why I brought the Chill Clip Riptide Fusion. Embarrassingly, I still missed a few hammers, even when they were frozen and not moving, but that's a me problem. I'm really awful at lining up my hammer shots. You should be fine. It doesn't matter what other special weapon you bring. In hindsight, maybe a rapid fire trench barrel or one two punch shotgun to squeeze more damage. I don't know, but as long as it's special so we have a better chance of creating more heavy. When we finally hit a damage phase, the priority should be on tractoring the boss straight away, then killing the Wellkeeper Knight and casting Super. Standing in the well and supering the boss should drop its shield pretty quick since he's debuffed from the first tractor shot. Once your super runs out, go into the rotation of tractor cannon shot and 5 to 6 bonks before reapplying tractor. If there are any adds nearby, give them a bonk to keep up roaring flames and your heals. If your health ever hits red, throw down a healing grenade. 
I was 1819 light and did this encounter in four phases. Also, don't forget to kill old mate's ghost. Remember how I mentioned we use double special to generate lots of heavy? Hopefully after this fight, there are purple bricks still on the ground. Before picking it up, change the loadout to that we used in the first section. Then go pick it up and you should have full machine gun ammo. Thankfully, the journey to the final boss is much shorter than the first. And the only part I want to comment on is the room with the wizards and ogre. It's not a tough room by any means, and if you have full or close to full heavy ammo, then your machine gun can take care of pretty much everything. The tip is to just be patient, and after jumping to a plate, make sure to fully clear what's around before progressing. Remember that tip about the disorientating grenades from the first part with the shriekers? Here is where it can really slow down the pace while you make the jumps and find cover. Be careful of the wizard that spawns behind you as well. On the final section, your super will be enough to handle the ogre and accompanying enemies. First off, congrats on making it to the final boss of the dungeon. Hopefully it hasn't been very painful so far. This one, for me at least, was a bit of an endurance test as the time to kill Samuma takes about the same time as all the encounters beforehand. With good damage and decent light level, it should be a 4 or 5 phase. Let's get started. First, we'll go over the loadout. I used a loadout swap for mechanics and DPS. However, it's not super necessary, and if you are not on PS5 or don't have an SSD for quick menu swaps, I would not recommend loadout swapping mid-encounter. For mechanics, I used Arbalest, a trace rifle, preferably hollow denial with lead from gold, and a bipod rocket launcher. I used Apex Predator from Last Wish Raid, but this dungeon's rocket, Cold Comfort, can also roll with bipod. But Prince, bipod is a 40% nerf to damage. It's a dumb perk. Yeah, I know, but we won't be firing a single rocket from this bad boy. The idea is that because we get extra reserves, when we swap to our DPS loadout, the ammo carries over into Leviathan's Breath Heavy Bow. Leviathan's Breath with Catalysts boosts reserves to 15, so every rocket we have corresponds to an arrow when we swap. We run double special so we have more heavy drops to scoop up after a damage phase, and as usual, a lot of our enemy kills will be coming from the bonk. Don't forget, if you have a different chest piece with 3 times solar reserves, to pick up the flag with this on, then swap to your normal chest piece after you pick up the flag so you get the benefits of the extra reserves for your first damage phase. The strategies I used for this encounter are as follows. 1. Prioritize when the boss summons moths and kill them as soon as possible. We know whenever Vorlog spawns, the boss will summon moths, so we can use this information to know roughly when they will come out. I had two failed flawless runs due to not killing a moth or two, and this is painful. Don't underestimate the moths. Always kill the moths. Two, kill the three boomer knights that spawn at the start of the encounter and after each damage phase. Though it's not necessary to kill these guys, they can be annoying if left up and start shooting you while you're trying to damage the boss. And three, this is a big one. Whenever you go for a reveal, make sure to hammer kill and add close to the reveal point. If you don't have healing before hitting the reveal, Samuma can destroy you while doing the reveal animation. Try and also have a healing grenade handy after the reveal in case your health is low from the incoming damage. Having a hammer charge is vital for this last encounter. Shit happens and sometimes we lose our Mjolnir. The good news is that if we go into a water area, we are completely safe while our ability recharges. Simply dip in and out of the water, like you're playing Marco Polo, until you have your trusty hammer back. 
You can also go to the other entrance if there are a lot of ads on one side blasting the door. When you kill the light bearers, if you have a few ads around, then the bonks should kill them in three shots. I tend to hold my super unless the Lucent Acolyte pops their Blade Barrage super, as these can one-shot you, and you don't want to get too close. I find this Acolyte only ever rarely pops their super, so going up and throwing the hammer at them a few times is pretty safe. If you have issues with any of the other guys, please feel free to pop your super on them as well, as you won't be using it for boss damage later. Have a game plan for where you would like to do boss damage from. Here's a great map, again from the same artist, Priony. For me, I like the skull, or top section best, as it has great cover, followed by the right knee and left hand. I've circled these spots in red. Knowing your favourite positions, all you really need to care about is the symbol where your favourite position is. Make sure to get that symbol last, and you'll be in great shape to line up your shots when it comes to damage. As far as I know, the hive bearing symbol locations are random, so if you go into a room where you see your last symbol, just leave and come back once you've done the two previous symbols. Once you've deposited your last vestige, pop Simuma's shield with a single arbalist shot. If you're using a different loadout for damage, swap to it now, otherwise get to work with those crispy precision hits. Hopefully a thrall or two come up to say hi, so give them a bonk to trigger health recovery. I liked using Leviathan's breath here, as it has heaps of aim assist, and I didn't get affected too much by flinch. I've seen other people use linear fusion rifles like Briar's Contempt from Root of Nightmares, or Cataclysmic from Valve Disciple. I didn't have too much success with Xenophage. If you use a sleeper simulant, just be careful that a round doesn't ricochet and kill you. It's pretty rare, but I've seen it happen. I was 18-19 light, and I think with decent damage, it would have been a comfortable 5 phase. I did mess up one of my rounds, so it ended up being a 6 phase. Depending on your light level, it may require more phases, or most likely less. Anyway, if you made it this far, thanks for watching the video, and I hope it helped you complete Ghosts of the Deep Dungeon solo.